Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, thank you and Paul and everybody else for the invitation to come here. It's really a pleasure not only be, to be in the capital of Canada, but also to be in the capital of extreme photonics, worldwide capital of extreme photonics. So uh, I'd, uh, for this reason, uh, I have to show you two topics. I hope it's not too much. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about ultrafast electron control in graphene, where we see fully coherent effects of strongly driven electrons in this spectacular 2D material. And I'd like to show you uh, control over free electrons, namely electrons that propagate in free space and that are efficiently accelerated by fields that we generate with these photonic structures here to build a small-scale laser-driven particle accelerator. Let's uh, start with the first topic. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, electronics uh, operates at frequencies uh, around a gigahertz, probably a little higher, and photonics operates at uh, roughly six orders of magnitude larger frequencies, so 100 terahertz uh, uh, up to the petahertz range. Uh, and you wonder, uh, can we do the same with uh, these very high frequency fields that we can do with electrons, namely to just shuffle electrons back and forth by virtue of the electric field? And uh, that's the, the big question. Uh, technically, uh, you can say, well, electronics is readily non-perturbative. What does that mean? Well, it's really the electric field that grabs an electron and shifts it somewhere. Whereas in photonics, we usually think um, in terms of the, uh, we think, think of the light field in terms of photons. So just little particles of, of energy, if you will. But can we do the same? Can we, can we take basically the same picture here? Can we use the optical field to, to also move electrons back and forth to really uh, do similar things that we could do at electronics, only now at much, much higher frequencies. Uh, and this, this is a, a quest that uh, can probably be answered uh, with something that has also has been pioneered here. I'll show you in a second. But of course, I first want to show you that there are, of course, uh, electronic uh, components that link uh, light fields and electrons. Uh, the, photodiode, as you all know. But just to make sure that we're on the same page here, these measure the light intensity. So the cycle averaged intensity. We are really interested in uh, using the optical carrier field here to control electrons and shift them one way or the other. Uh, and, and really, we, we talk about optical fields, optical light fields, uh, and think about them just like microwave fields only at much higher frequencies, and this is what we're going to be using. So you can ask the question, can a, a strong field or attosecond physics be helpful? Because there it has been pioneered that you can really think of an electron or an electron matter wave function being shifted around by the field. And of course, for electronics, these uh, uh, electrons have to be inside of a conductor. So in order to take advantage of this, you really want to want to be able to, to use these electrons. So can we do, can we play with atom second or strong field physics inside of a conductor? That is the main question. And of course, uh, you know probably that you have to go ultra short and intense. So short pulses help and intense pulses as well. And then you can do something that, that you've probably seen uh, several times here in Adowa, uh, as I learned yesterday. Um, you can uh, take a light field and just shift the uh, confining potential of an atom uh, and then uh, electrons or electronic matter waves, if we will, can be released. Uh, and when the light field flips sign, they can be driven back. And this is exactly uh, the foundation of strong field or attosecond physics. Uh, one beautiful experiment that, that comes from here that I just want to show you is uh, where you can drive electronic matter wave function away from a molecule and have it then recollide with this parent ion pair here to image this molecule. So that's, that's just spectacular. If you have this control over this electron wave function, you can directly use it for, for imaging this uh, molecular orbital here. We did something similar. Uh, we uh, could show that this uh, recollision that you can drive an electron away and back also works with solid objects. But here, it only worked at the surface of a solid object, so it worked in vacuum. And of course, you know, vacuum electronics has been quite useful, but that's uh, 50 years ago. So we really want to take control of electrons inside of solids. And that's what, I, what, I, what I'd like to focus on uh, in the first part of this talk. There's been lots of work uh, ever since this pioneering work by David Reese's group in 2011, uh, strong field on attosecond physics inside of solids. This is mainly always in large band gap semiconductors, large band gap dielectrics. And let's try and see, can we do uh, and go and do strong field and attosecond physics inside of a conductor? 
Um, well, first off, why have people so far used dielectrics or large band gap semiconductors? Well, you can just get the light field in, which is good if you want to control the electrons inside of the material. Um, in a metal, you all know light is usually reflected, or if you crank up the intensity, the remaining part that is absorbed can even, either, they can also do just damage, and so that's, that's pretty bad. And that's why so far, focus was on large band gap materials where you can get the light in. But how can you then now bridge out of second physics and uh, conducting material? And the answer is, uh, well, take graphene. Uh, you know, this uh, wonderful 2D, atomically thin material. Uh, it's a semi-metal, so it's conducting. Uh, it has strong light mirror interaction. An atomic layer of atoms can absorb 2.3% of the light. That's a large absorption coefficient for a single layer of, um, of atoms. The nice thing is only 2% are absorbed, so 98% go through and don't do any damage, and yet the material, excuse me, yet, oops, excuse me again, yet the material sees all the light that go through, so sees the strong driving field here. So graphene, I think, is also interesting for extreme photonics, if you will. This is what we do. We just uh, use graphene epitaxially grown on silicon carbide, and then we just uh, put two gold electrodes here, uh, and we don't apply any DC voltage, so the system is totally left-right symmetric, but we do measure a current. Now, why is that? Because we shoot laser pulses with a stable carrier envelope phase, so it's the light field that we can control here by controlling the phase between the maximum of this optical carrier here and the maximum of the envelope, and so this form, the exact form of the light field breaks the left-right symmetry, and that suffices to uh, excite a current that we can measure with a, a better multimeter, if you will. So uh, what can we expect? Um, already uh, many years ago, um, it has been shown that um, uh, the quantum path interference between different excitation paths can break a left-right symmetry, and this is the famous Dirac-Cohn dispersion relation of graphene that I'm showing here. Uh, this is, as you can see here, I, I, I'm, I'm drawing these arrows. This you can think about, think of the photons. Uh, it's a perturbative picture. That can result into a current. And now if we increase the intensity, something else can happen. Um, now when we look at the one slice uh, of, uh, of this Dirac cone here that is not exactly at the K point, so we take a play, slice uh, that is slightly away here, you see there is an apparent band cap. When you look at this here, you can see that we can drive electrons in the valence and in the conduction band. And you see here there, there is a band cap, and you probably all know when you inject electrons here fast enough, they can undergo a landau zener transition and continue up here, and the same up here. You can shoot them in here, they can, they can undergo a landau zener transition and go down here. Uh, so it's an entirely different process. You see it's field-driven. There is intraband motion that is coupled with interband transitions, and that's the secret. We cannot tell apart intraband motion and interband transitions when you go to large fields, and then this non-perturbative picture really breaks down just because the states are not really, well, anyways, we can, we can discuss. Uh, but uh, we're, uh, we're, we're re really going from here to here, and I want to convince you that we're in this regime here. Where we see something beautiful happening, uh, and that is something that you can picture this way. So we want to bring electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. Uh, now I try to convince you that there are two different ways within one optical period. So when the electron feels a light field that drives it to the right in K space, it's driven here, can undergo a landau zener transition. When the light field flips sign, the electron can be driven back and stay in the conduction band. And the exact same thing can happen, that the electron first stays in the valence band and only on the way back undergoes a landau zener transition. And you see two initial states that are identical to identical final states. So these two different pathways can interfere and give rise to what's known as a landau zener stuckelberg interferometry. So it's two subsequent landau zener transitions. They have to be coherent with each other, and uh, that can give rise to beautiful quantum pathway interference, but in a different, basically different quantum pathways than in the photon orders. Uh, interesting enough, uh, we think this is a fast-living world. Uh, excuse me, Stückelberg in 32 uh, cited even the original work by Landau and Zener, where he realized that you can drive landau zener transitions coherently all came out in 1932, so already back then, science was moving pretty fast, I guess. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what, we, what we do. We shoot uh, short laser pulses at graphene, short oscillator pulses, two optical cycles short. 
we focus them down pretty hard and reach peak fields of roughly three volts per nanometer. We shoot them at this monolayer graphene on silicon carbide here you can see it then we just attach gold electrodes and measure the current with a multimeter. Um, this is what we expect from a simple tight binding model simulation. Here you see the conduction band population as function of time when this graphene is strongly driven. And you see here the conduct excited conduction band population sloshing back and forth. And uh, after the pulse has gone, you see it looks almost fully left and right symmetric, which would mean no current. But that's not true. There is this little bubble here, and that breaks the left-right symmetry, and that is responsible for the current that we measure. And so let me, let me show you uh, how the measurements look like. Well, in theory, we, we just then integrate over the entire Brion zone, and now we can explain the current that we measure. Initially, we see a current going to the left, and then we crank up the field strength we see, um, and we have better data now, and this is original data, I'm sorry, I could have updated this plot. We see that all of a sudden, the current flows into the other direction and just gets larger and larger. And uh, we can now nicely explain this. This is the perturbative regime where we have quantum path interference where current flows to the one side, and then this landau zinnerberg the strongly driven coupled intraband interband uh, transition take over. Uh, and this is the uh, theory curve here uh, that fits uh, surprisingly well, I have to say. Um, there's more. We can switch to circular polarization. Uh, we can see, uh, do we get a CEP-dependent current when we operate with circularly polarized light? Uh, and indeed, we also get a CEP-dependent current, uh, but the effect is uh, entirely different. That is basically a dipole matrix element argument. When you have a CEP-dependent current, uh, you can look at it uh, for one of this carrier envelope phase, you drive the electron relatively close to the Dirac point where you have the largest transition dipole matrix element. So here we expect a large conduction band excitation, whereas for another phase, uh, the closest trajectory points are somewhere here, much further away from the Dirac point, and that's why the current should be smaller. And so also here, also with circular polarization, we're sensitive to the carrier envelope phase, but we don't see any change, sign change, and yet our theory can explain this here. Um, that's interesting for the following reason. Of course, you all know we can decompose circularly polarized light into two linear components that are phase shifted. So uh, uh, let's see uh, if we do this here. We have now the circularly polarized light that induces a negative current, as you've seen, flowing to the left. Now, if we decompose it, uh, we have one component that excites a current to the right, and we have another component that stands perpendicular to the graphene ribbon, and just by symmetry, arguments, you can see that, that this component here cannot induce any current. It's, it's polarized this way. But interestingly, if we mix in this component, we get this polarization where the current flows to the left. If we block this component, current flows to the right. So if you will, we have a field now that doesn't do anything in its own right, but it does switch the current direction. So if you will, you call it a light field effect transistor or so. Uh, it's kind of fun to see. Um, it, it really works. Uh, we, of course, understand it based on these two different pictures. Uh, here, for linear polarization, we have landau zener stuckelbeck interference, uh, strongly driven currents uh, that lead to relatively, excuse me, strongly driven electrons that lead to relatively large currents. Whereas if we change the polarization angle, go to circular polarization, uh, this Landers and Stuckelbeck interference cannot take place, and we see this, uh, this other effect, uh, and we can nicely switch the, switch the current direction by controlling this. So this, this works beautifully, and oops, sorry, that was too fast. Um, and and uh, you see, we, 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 we can really control these currents inside of graphene, more or less by the light field. It's, of course, a little bit more complicated. There, there are different various effects, but it's nice to see that these strongly driven electrons lead to a, lead to a large current. We can discuss later. Let me uh, sh stay with graphene here, and uh, now we want to look at charge transfer out of graphene. I'll show you in a second. Charge transfer is something very interesting uh, because, of course, well, charge transfer is, induces many transitions in, in chemistry, et cetera, and it's known that uh, within a single molecule, charges can, can migrate very fast from one end to the other, uh, clearly on the sub-femtosecond time scale. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that, uh, for example, to, to have a very fast nonlinear element or so, passive element, you could think of, well, let's go to these atomically layered materials because there the electrons in one layer sit very close to another layer. Uh, and so people have looked into that. They have, for example, looked into molybdenum dull sulfide here 
heterostructures where they sh uh, shoot the laser beam and then just see how fast this charge transfer happening here. Uh, and interesting enough, um, usually excitons form here in these systems, and they limit the charge transfer time to something like you can find in the literature record time scales of 7 to 30 femtoseconds. You wonder, can you go faster? Uh, and uh, so here it's really the excitons that, that, that limit these time scales. Um, so we looked at uh, uh, our system here. No, I just rotated the figure. Uh, now graphene sits here before we were looking into, into effects in the plane. Now we're interested in looking at the electrons that go from graphene into a now N-doped silicon carbide. So it's just the same, so same structure, only that the silicon carbide is now N-doped. Uh, and what we do is we shoot laser pulses and uh, see, uh, look at the excitation of the pulses in graphene and how fast they go over this interface. And this interface is interesting, a metal or semi-metal semiconductor interface, that's a Schottky junction. Very important uh, device in electronics, uh, a metal semiconductor interface. And there is a little barrier here, so you have to, when you excite electrons, they can go over or tunnel through this barrier. And we were interested in how fast do the electrons make it from graphene that I'm sketching here in scale space now uh, to silicon carbide. And what we did is we use saturable absorption. So we just increase the laser power uh, so much that uh, either the ground state here becomes depleted so that this transition cannot happen, uh, happen anymore or that the excited state becomes blocked, uh, well, filled up so much that poly blocking kicks in and that all the excited states here are filled up. And so we can just now measure the rate of charge transfer, or excuse me, we can use this, this saturation as an internal clock, if you will. Uh, let's, uh, let me show you in a bit more detail. Um, uh, so what we have here is now the current that we measure as function of laser fluence that we apply. And you see this red curve here is for a relatively large reverse bias voltage, so for a small Schottky barrier. This is for a relatively high Schottky barrier here, zero volts. And you, and you see these curves are not really easy to understand, and yet our theory curves, the, the solid lines, fit almost perfectly to the data points. Why is that? Because we really understand the processes involved here. So what we have is we can now, here on these two plots, we show basically the same data, just plotted slightly different. The fluence axis is now logarithmic, and more importantly, we don't show the current, but we show the current divided by the average laser power, which means when you have a slope, a uh, straight slope here, uh, that will result in something flat here. So you see a little bit more of these kinks, et cetera, in these plots. And uh, what well, we really understand what's going on, we have uh, one contribution that is so-called prompt internal photoemission. You excite an electron, makes it over. Uh, that is the blue part here. There is also a component that is called, uh, that is a photothermionic current. I don't want to go into detail. That is the green one here. And we have another one that is two photon prompt internal photoemission. This is this black one that kicks in here. And these two processes can be really nicely modeled and can be extracted from these curves here. And why do we do that? We only do it to extract what is the saturation fluence. So at which fluence does this prompt internal photoemission current drop to one half? Uh, of its maximum value. So we only want to know this point. And uh, when we know that, we can now plot this saturation fluence as function of the laser pulse duration. So we change the laser pulse duration, uh, positive chirp, negative chirp, so we make the pulses longer. And uh, watch what happens here. At zero volts, for example, we hardly see any dependence of the saturation fluence on the laser pulse duration, which, me which means that this charge transfer takes time, takes place on time scales much longer than all the laser pulse durations we have here. The process is basically insensitive to this here. But now if we increase the bias voltage, meaning we lower this Schottky barrier, uh, we see that all of a sudden we, get, we can really get a very steep dependence, so steep that, that uh, well, it's, it's not somehow leveling off here, so it's really going steep down here, so that uh, even when we shoot the six femtoseconds, uh, we really see a change right away, so that means that this charge transfer takes place on time scales faster than the laser pulse duration. And this is exactly also what we, what we then can extract when we really model this here. Uh, we see that the charge transfer time scale for the six volts can be as fast as 300 attoseconds. So we excite an electron and boom, it goes over the barrier. 
But 300 attos seconds is, of course, such a short time scale that we really have to be careful taking Heisenberg, et cetera, into account. So we have a large uncertainty in the energy. Uh, so we should, we should really also model this quantum mechanically. So this is what we've done with a very simplistic model. I don't want to discuss it here, but this is a quantum mechanical model uh, to, to simulate what's going on here. And this gives us this line here. So uh, uh, it matches our, um, our results here. Only these very long time scales for small voltages, we cannot explain, and we believe this is uh, because we model it with a single electron wave function here, but over here we certainly have basically a space charge in um, the silicon carbide that blocks the transfer, and that's why uh, we got this steep dependence uh, on a charge transfer time scale with applied DC voltage. So we have a passive component that also works at sub one femtosecond time scale now, a Schottky junction, uh, and that uh, could be interesting for whatever, it's even a voltage tunable, uh, device where you can be, where you can have very, very fast intrinsic time scales. That was pretty technical. Sorry. Uh, still, I thought it might be interesting. Uh, uh, now it's getting less technical. I want to spend the last 10 minutes uh, for the second part. Um, controlling electrons at photonic structures and building a uh, particle accelerator on a chip. That's the big goal. Uh, of the Accelerator on a Chip International Program. I will introduce it to you in a second. Here's kind of an artist's impression. We basically use transparent building blocks uh, to control the fields to accelerate and confine electrons along the structure. And uh, let me show you uh, why that could be interesting. Uh, when we as uh, physicists and uh, electrical engineers think about accelerators, we probably think about these big machines here. As you all know, um, the accelerators for science, uh, kilometers long. Um, Japan is courageous enough to consider building this 30 kilometer long international linear collider. Why is it 30 kilometer long? Or why does it have to be 30 kilometers long? Well, our friends in the particle physics business want to do Higgs spectroscopy. That means they need one or several TeV electrons. Uh, several TeV can be generated uh, when you uh, employ uh, an acceleration gradient of roughly 30 megavolts per meter. So this is, this is what people in the accelerator business feel comfortable with. Larger gradients are, are not really stable for their accelerators. Now you divide one TeV by 30 mega electron volts per meter, you end up with roughly 30 kilometers. So it's this gradient that sets the size of the machine. That is true for the science machines, but it's also true for these machines that you probably all know from a hospital, uh, these L-shaped machines that scan around the body of a patient. Why are they L-shaped? Because there's an accelerator in here, one meter long accelerator, and this one meter long accelerator has to be one meter long because you need energetic electrons to generate like, relatively high energy X-rays to go through uh, your body. Uh, and now also here's the question, well, if we had an acceleration gradient factor of 100 larger, you could shrink this here uh, and have it uh, not a meter long, but a centimeter long, and it would, easy, would, would easily fit in here. You can probably even insert it into the body of a patient and come up with entirely new imaging or treatment modalities. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to realize uh, that um, Varian Medical and Siemens, who have joined forces, sell uh, one of these machines per day of these big machines. So that's a big market. Any university, of course, has them. Uh, and you can probably really shrink them if you have other um, accelerator schemes at your disposal. How come the acceleration gradient is limited to something like 30 or 100 megavolts per meter? That is because of surface breakdown. The microwave cavities here that are used in these accelerators can only withstand surface fields of an impressive 200 million volts per meter. That's what it is. Uh, but you know that you can shoot very high power laser light through glass and you don't damage the glass. So uh, in order to damage glass with laser light, you need to apply a field strength of well, roughly 10 gigavolts per meter, 30 gigavolts per meter. And it's exactly this factor of roughly 100 that we want to take advantage of to reach gradients. And a gradient is just the field times the charge of the electron, which is just one E. So you just have to squeeze an E in here, and you, you arrive at the maximum acceleration gradient. It's this factor of 100 that we want to take advantage of to also reach factor of 100 larger acceleration gradients. Um, where do we, well, and this is how these structures could look like. You'll see in a second, it's exactly the same principle that we want to employ, employ that's being employed here. You need something periodic through which you can send your electron beam. You send this electron through the channel of these two colonnades here, fire the laser light from the side, and you get the same effect here. How does that work? 
Um, this is how every accelerator works. It's a so-called phase synchronous acceleration. You have to make sure that when the electron uh, experiences a field, that it points into the forward direction. So if you send an electron through a tube, just make sure when it's between two tubes that it sees an accelerating field. So when the electron is hidden again here, you can just swap the polarity, make sure the electron is accelerated again here, swap, accelerate again, swap, accelerate again, and so on. And by this, with a finite AC voltage, that's important that it's AC, but with a finite voltage, you can in principle generate arbitrarily high electron energies uh, just because you make it arbitrarily long. That's a very old principle, uh, and we're gonna use the same, or we want to use the same in optics. What do you do? You better shoot the laser light from the side because then the electric field points such that it can, be, it can exert an accelerating force. But you know that in free space, half an optical period later, the laser field turns around and just takes the energy out that you've imparted to the electron here. So in free space, that can't work, at least not in leading order. But when you put a simple glass grating, it can work. So the glass has an index of refraction larger than one, meaning that the light propagates more slowly here than in vacuum over here. So what you do is you basically corrugate the face front of the light. This light has just traveled a little further here than here. So now what you do is you have an accelerating force for the electron here. The electron sweeps over here, light comes from here. And when you match the period of your grading to the velocity of the electron and the wavelength of light, you can make sure that the electron always feels an accelerating force. Accelerated here, accelerated half a period later here because the electron moves forward, light moves forward. So what you do is you basically rectify the field in the frame co-moving with the electron. Uh, this is the simple sketch. This is, of course, we're all in, in optics. We know this is a diffraction grading, what I've shown you here. Uh, when you fulfill the synchronicity condition, then you basically generate a mode that propagates along the surface of the grading. Light comes from here, but you generate this mode that goes here on which the electrons can serve and can continuously be accelerated. They can also be continuously decelerated. And interestingly enough, you can also exert forces transversely. So they can feel a force towards the surface or away from the surface, which is important for deflection, focusing, etc. There are many structures that people have come up with uh, to provide boundary conditions to control the electrons. I want to focus on this one here and this dual grading structure that you've seen. Um, in 2013, uh, Bob Bayer's group in Stanford and Slack could uh, show an impressive 250 mega electron volt per meter gradient uh, with relativistic electrons. We used uh, electrons from an electron microscope and could uh, demonstrate 25 MeV per meter, so already on par with, for example, what Slack is operating at. Um, they could achieve this large gradient that's a factor of 10 larger right away because it's easier to accelerate relativistic electrons. And so that's great. Um, after these results, the Gordon and Buddy Moore Foundation set out to, to fund a program uh, where we have accumulated uh, electron source experts, light coupling experts, nanofabrication experts, electron simulate, excuse me, acceleration, accelerator experts uh, to build a shoebox sized one MeV accelerator and the actual chip will probably be only one centimeter long. Watch here, we only have one year left, but I'm still optimi optimistic that we'll make it. Um, and uh, so that's, that's interesting. I don't have time to show you all the great work from this collaboration. I just want to show you two results from our group. This was the collaboration a couple of weeks ago in Hamamatsu, Japan, where Hamamatsu Photonics is one of our industry partners. Uh, and uh, so we're currently at the point where we really go from the demonstration of individual functional elements to the control of complex electron dynamics while we accelerate them. I'll show you in a second. So we've shown acceleration, deflection, uh, concatenated acceleration. Of course, you have to get the face right if you show, uh, shoot two laser beams. Uh, we can have optical focusing if you just put your gratings, this, cut your gratings this way. Uh, we have good electron sources. These tip-based electron sources are high brightness sources that, are allow, that allow us to inject the electron beam into this narrow channel here. And we have these new dual pillar structures that work really great where you shine the light from the side and send the electron beam through this narrow channel here. When we accelerate the electrons, after some time, they will certainly crash into the walls of this very narrow channel here. So we have to make sure that they are also being collimated. Sorry, I thought I had one minute. Uh, I'll skip through this here. So this is where we stand. We keep the beams together. Uh, this looks like a real accelerator, right? If you will, small, we're getting there. And uh, I'll jump here. Oh, wow, sorry. Um, uh, we can also generate attosecond pulses by introducing an energy modulation, have the electrons propagate, and then they bunch. Uh, so we have recently shown 270 short 
270 short at a second electron punches. Uh, that also works with another scheme, we'll skip that, and we'll come to the end uh, with this uh, outlook slide. Uh, where do we stand? We want to take advantage of photonics technology to build a little accelerator. Uh, of course, photonics is a huge market, uh, as we all know, driven by uh, industry, internet, etc. So uh, we think maybe it's a similar story to radar klystrons that have been invented for radar technology, uh, but they really drove classical accelerators and without the klystrons they would have never been CERN or anything like that. Uh, maybe photonics can also drive little chip scale particle accelerators. That brings me to the end. Uh, this is my wonderful group. Um, and uh, so in the first part, I hope I could show you that we can now drive electrons strongly in graphene. We have now also a passive element that operates on sub femtosecond time scales. Also here, the current is excited in less than one femtosecond, so maybe this can really help us to bridge photonics and electronics. And in the second part, I had to show you, and apology for the amount of uh, stuff that I've shown you, laser acceleration of free electrons. It's this photonic structure, uh, and maybe we soon have an accelerator on a chip. Thanks very much, and I'll be happy to take any question. Peter, wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question and maybe an idea for you for the first part of your talk with these uh, uh, Lano Zener non abiotic transitions. Uh, many years ago, we had discovered and characterized a strong field ionization mechanism in linear molecules, which we described in exactly this same way as, as non abiotic, non resident ladder, ladder climbing. And uh, the, the physics you described, including the, uh, the Lando Dickney theory of non abiotic transitions, really looks very much the same. At the time, we uh, thought about ways to uh, characterize this and maybe control it further, which we didn't do, but I think maybe you could do this, which is that uh, the non abiotic transitions have to do with the time rate of change of the field, not the field strength itself. So, from That's that true. point of view, the transitions happen when the field is changing the fastest, which is at the zero crossings of the field, not right. at the maximum of the field. That's true. And so um, you could actually control this and tailor this really at will by uh, adding the second harmonic field to the fundamental. And by adjusting the phase between the fundamental and second harmonic, you can either sharpen or flatten uh, the uh, field uh, rate of change around the zero crossings. And I wonder if you've thought about this or tried this. Uh, thanks, thank you so much, Abbott. Um, maybe we discussed it already a couple of years ago because uh, we did exactly this. Uh, it's too early to show your results. Uh, we see already that we got much larger currents, factor of 10 larger, uh, but it's, um, it's, let's put it this way, it's really hard. Um, we don't, uh, for some reason, the data is not as clean as what we see here, so we're still trying to figure out uh, what's going on there. Uh, but yes, absolutely. I mean, it's of course fantastic, and I mean, you've done you've done beautiful work uh, with Omega to Omega. We, we we definitely wanted to do it, and we're still on it. But it's unfortunately premature. I, we haven't fully understood the data. What we see already, effect of ten larger current. Thank you. Nice talk, Peter. Um, in the first part of your talk, you you showed that you can use graphene as a super fast photodiode, basically. But if I want to read, if I want to be able to see this field. I would need to have a scope, which is also working at the same speed. Or thank is you. there thank another you. way of looking at this uh, oscillating uh, field? Thank you. Uh, that, is, that is, of course, a, a great point. That's why, uh, and I didn't spell it out to you, it was really hard for us to uh, see how can we measure this. That's why we came up with this method that we called uh, charge transfer time measurement via laser pulse duration dependent saturation fluence determination. The obvious acronym is, of course, chameleon, right? Um, so uh, we, we really had to use something internal. Uh, of course, it would be spectacular if we can, uh, let me go back, uh, if we can um, shoot, and, and we have that in mind, if we, uh, so currently, boy, I'm sorry. Uh, currently, our laser pulses are polarized in plane here. So what would be fantastic if we could also, uh, with a relatively strong field, to somehow modify the, really the electron transfer here by just adding uh, another laser field or something like that. We're, we're thinking about this. Um, and that could be a way of, of really applying some streaking techniques or something like that to measure this more directly. To connect to the first talks, do your talk to your very fast electron currents emit terahertz radiation? Thank you. Also, excellent question. Um, uh, 
we haven't yet looked yet. Let's put it this way. And I was very curious to see uh, the sensitivity increasing if your detectors. There's probably not much that comes out there, but maybe yes. I mean, uh, it could really well be. So Peter, it was a very nice talk. I would like to ask you about, you talk about get making out of second electrons. Could you sort of discuss what the impact they may be? They're hard to keep together, I think, because they're quite dispersive and uh, they're kind of diffuse and so it might be hard to use. So I wanted to have your thoughts on using them. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me just show you uh, what I had to jump over here. Uh, here's uh, here's uh, how, we, how we measure this here. Oh boy, I'm sorry. Uh, here's how we generate these out of second short electrons and then we have one, and you're exactly right, uh, only one plane uh, that somewhere sits here where, we, where this somehow temporal lens uh, has its focal plane, so where the electrons are short. Uh, but what we'd like to do is really to, for example, now that bridges you, the, the question of the two of you, uh, to, for example, uh, put our graphene here and do uh, electron diffraction on a sample that you can put here. So it's very easy to just cut this chip here or, or move it and, and just have something here through which the electron beam propagates and, and to probably even laser excite it and then do laser pump electron probe spectroscopy. Ideally for that, we would really have just a single um, attosecond pulse and not a pulse train. But uh, we have ideas how we can, uh, with slightly more complicated bunching structures, not only basically generate an out of second pulse train, but also compress it this way. Uh, but of course, you're totally right. I mean, like a, like a, it's, you can think about it like the focus of a laser beam. Uh, the temporal depth, uh, et cetera, really depends on, on, on the focusing properties. And here, this is the, the temporal focus of an electron beam. I think it, it, it could really be interesting as another means to, uh, you, you know, there's this ultra-fast electron microscopy that seems to be really growing. Uh, here, um, we're, we're, we're reaching, already sub femtosecond uh, time scales. So maybe, especially with the graphene where we see this very, very fast electron dynamics, uh, we, could, we could also use the graphene as a sample to probe here, even though that is far away. There's just a, just a beautiful uh, paper coming out soon by, um, I forgot the group, Chinese group, uh, where they showed that they can image um, charge the charges uh, with atomic resolution inside of a material. So you can really see electrons now in materials with an electron microscope. This here with time resolution probably takes at least 10 years or so to get there, but it could be interesting. Peter, while you had that slide up, I wanted to follow on Paul's question a little bit. Uh, you probably know that there is a, a small community of people that are interested in building a compact XFEL. Yeah. And, and the idea is to generate uh, a structured electron bunch and then to use inverse Compton scattering in order to generate this. And so I wondered if you thought about whether the technologies that you are developing could make an even more compact uh, XFEL. So the XFEL is really tough to reach, but we hope that, uh, I mean, it would be spectacular uh, with, with uh, with these bunched electron beams to just look at super radiant effects in Smith Bosset radiation or something like that. So, uh, you know, it's a very old field, but we're currently in touch uh, with, with uh, for example, Avi Gauvert and, and uh, pioneers in that field who to really rethink, okay, what do we have at our disposal now to, to answer questions like these? XFEL is tough, I'm pretty sure, just because of the, uh, of the number of electrons that you need per, per bucket. Uh, but of course, it could be a dream also for us. Um, yeah, so regarding the results on graphene, I was wondering in other 2D materials, you have topological effects uh, that effectively give rise to something which looks like a, like a Lorentz force. So you have an, a field in one direction and you should get a deflection in another direction, so in a perpendicular direction. Do you think with other materials you could actually use uh, the, the structures you have as a tool to analyze those topological, uh, like, uh, Lawrence kind of forces? That's also an excellent question. We, 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 we looked into this. Um, we currently don't have case space resolution other than looking at a residual current. And we don't see any way how topological effects uh, that are oftentimes uh, um, very symmetric uh, could lead to a current that only flows in one direction. If we had technologies at our disposal like, like ARPAS, angle resolve, photo emission spectroscopy, uh, then probably yes. But um, if you can come up with any scheme where we don't need direct case, case space imaging, uh, that could be fantastic. I, 
unfortunately don't know the answer to this, also a very intriguing question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.